Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're tuning in from. Uh, and welcome to uh, Clinique Pasteur in Toulouse. My name is Darren Mylott. I'm an interventional cardiologist from Galway in Ireland, and I'm joined by my colleague and friend, um, Dr. Jean-Charles uh, Spichage, who's a fellow here in Toulouse. Welcome. Um, and thank you for joining us for this uh, PCR webinar on streamlined transfemoral TAVI. Um, we have a very interesting case for you today, and we're going to uh, we're going to drop down to the cath lab to see uh, to see Didier Teche and Nicolas Dumontil, who are going to perform the case uh, in the next few minutes. But first, a request: this is this is your webinar. We're here to answer your questions, and so if you look at your screens on the right hand side, there's an area that you can submit your questions to us. Please do so. Um, ask us your questions, your queries. Be them practical. Be them theoretical. Uh, and Jean-Charles is going to help me with the questions here. Um, already we have a, a, a very nice uh, um, uh, best wishes from Dr. Ramachandra, uh, so thank you for that. And we look forward to, uh, to your questions throughout the case. Um, maybe we'll start by, uh, by discussing the case, um, the patient um, uh, for today's webinar. If we could have the slides up, please. Okay, so the case is an 81-year-old female patient. Um, she presents with class 3 dyspnea uh, after a, an admission to the hospital here in Toulouse for acute pulmonary oedema. Uh, echocardiography, as you will see, demonstrates severe aortic stenosis. And this lady, all, despite her advanced age, uh, um, is a recently retired farmer, but still extremely active. Um, uh, she lives independently with her husband, who still farms. Um, and her only past medical history is that of hypertension. Importantly, this is a very small lady. She's 155 centimeters. She's only 50 kilos with a body mass index of 21 kilograms per meter squared. Um, despite being active, the team believe that she is really very frail um, and thus um, uh, the, the decision to perform transfemoral TAVI. Um, on admission, she was uh, in stable hemodynamic status. Her ECG demonstrates sinus rhythm with a normal PR and narrow QRS complex. Her laboratory indices are largely within normal limits. Her hemoglobin is 11.4. Her creatinine is 53 with an estimated GFR of 86. And her NT pro BNP is 1,200. So although this BNP was drawn one month after her heart failure admission, she still exhibits uh, uh, some biological evidence of, uh, of congestive cardiac failure. Um, the echocardiogram um, confirms severe aortic stenosis with an aortic valve area of 0.7 centimeters squared and a mean gradient of 45 millimeters of mercury. Left ventricular function uh, is preserved with an ejection fraction of 60%. There is mild concomitant mitral regurgitation, and her um, pulmonary pressures uh, are uh, relatively normal, 40 millimeters uh, of mercury. The CT scan demonstrates a tri-leaflet aortic valve with moderate calcification. The perimeter is 77 millimeters, and the perimeter-derived diameter is 24.5 millimeters. So this valve is really within the sizing range for a variety of commercially available transcatheter valves. The LVOT is, is large, it's 25 millimeters, with large um, sinuses of Valsalva, the right coronary artery being 17.8, and the left main being 16.8, suggesting that the risk of coronary artery occlusion in this case is, is really very low. Um, there is some complexity and, at the level of the peripheral vasculature. From this slide, you will see that the left-hand side, the left femoral artery, there's a stenosis um, with a minimal diameter of 4.5 millimeters. And on the right-hand side, although there is um, uh, adequate diameters with a minimal lumen diameter of 6.8 millimeters, we see that there is some calcification, and indeed, uh, maybe this is something the team are going to need to consider as they perform this transfemoral TAVI. Furthermore, if you look a little bit further north, you'll see just below the level of the renal arteries that there is a, uh, some kinking uh, of, the, uh, of the descending aorta. And it will be interesting to, uh, to hear the team in the cath lab and how they're going to manage um, uh, this, uh, this peripheral anatomy. Um, the implanters view that the team have chosen from the CT scan is LAO21, caudal 9, um, the annulus appears to be reasonably horizontal, and of course, this can impact the choice of valve and the, and the treatment strategy. 
the patient was discussed here uh, at the heart team uh, in Toulouse. Uh, and although she, the patient is 81, um, she is extremely frail. And despite the low Euroscore and STS score, it was really that frail status um, uh, in an elderly female. Um, they believed that she was intermediate risk for surgical aortic valve replacement. And as transfemoral TAVI was an option, um, that's what the team have, uh, have decided to do. And so over the next uh, hour to 90 minutes, um, the objectives of this webinar are to understand the, uh, which steps of a transfemoral TAVI procedure can be simplified, aiming at improving safety and efficacy uh, of a transfemoral TAVI procedure, uh, to learn how to use cerebral embryonic protection with the Sentinel device, and also to review the key steps of implantation of an accurate NEO valve, which the team have decided to use for this, uh, for this, uh, for this case. And so I think uh, at this stage, it's time to, to hand you over to the cath lab, uh, to Didier and Nicolas and the team uh, in the cath lab. But uh, I would, of course, encourage you to please uh, uh, send us your questions, and we can help you interact with the, with the team in the cath lab. So uh, Nicolas and Didier, over to you, my friends. So thank, thank you very much, uh, Darren, and uh, welcome uh, to everybody, of course, to attend this uh, this webinar. I think you've you've said everything regarding the the main objectives uh, and uh, what we aim at during the, uh, this uh, this live case. Um, briefly, let me just present the team here that uh, we will work with during this uh, this hour. So, to my right is my partner and friend Didier Cheche. You you all know, of course, we will be the, both the operators for this procedure. We uh, work with uh, one nurse who is scrubbed in with us, who is today Laurence. Uh, one nurse who is circulating in the room to, to give us uh, all the materials we need, that is Grégoire. And uh, our colleague, uh, Dr. Gabiash, who is the anesthesiologist, who will uh, take care of the patient regarding that side. So I think without waiting more, Didier, yep. what, what is interesting now is to present our strategy and uh, what we're going to do. Okay, th thank you, uh, Nico. Uh, so uh, Darren has uh, nicely summarized the key learning objectives of this uh, webinar, so there's no need to uh, uh, repeat them. So let's move to the next uh, slide. So uh, uh, quite uh, uh, briefly, the most important aspect of this uh, live transmission is to demonstrate a streamlined procedure. So that we will uh, perform the case uh, with a patient uh, prepared under conscious sedation with uh, some local anesthesia that Nicolas is going to uh, provide. Uh, we will need uh, free uh, arterial accesses. So we will get two femoral accesses uh, for the big shift and then uh, to, uh, the angiography is guiding the procedure. But we will also need a right radial access because we're going to protect this particular patient based on the peripheral vasculature and the risk of uh, cerebral emboli with a cerebral protection device, namely the uh, sentinel device that is uh, implanted and placed through the right radial access. We will uh, also uh, go for a direct implantation, no predilatation, and we can discuss that at this point. So we uh, strongly encourage you and all the attendees to uh, uh, send your questions, and we will do our best to answer them during this uh, uh, webinar. And we will also uh, demonstrate what are the key aspects of pacing uh, the left ventricle through, through uh, the wire that will be a safari uh, today, if required. So Nicolas is going to go to guide you and drive you through uh, the preparation of the right uh, femoral axis that will be the, the arterial line uh, housing the 18 French shift. And then we will uh, go through the steps of the deployment of the cerebral protection claret uh, sentinel, sorry, sentinel device. And then the device will be, uh, the TAVI device itself will be an accurate uh, neo large uh, because Darren, has, uh, you have nicely demonstrated that the analyst was in the range of a various uh, various uh, types of uh, devices and for uh, a accurate neo it's, it was a kind of in a gray zone between a, a medium size and a large size we have decided to use a large size we can go more into details uh, into the uh, the reasons for that but briefly and um, uh, before going uh, to the case itself as you see on the slide, the accurate NEO is a self-expanding device. It's a 19 0 stand frame that houses a truly flat uh, uh, pericardial valve with an anti-calcific treatment. You can see that there are, there are three levels. We find at the uh, bottom part of the, the stand frame, uh, the uh, lower crown. The lower crown is really meant to sit 
all around the annulus and the LVOT and to uh, provide the sealing of the device. And then above, we have the upper crown. The upper crown are more or less meant uh, to prevent any uh, risk of coronary uh, obstruction, to my understanding and from our experience, because they can uh, literally uh, put uh, the leaflets far from the coronary ostiums. Then you can see that the valve itself is supraannular. It's a supraannular functioning uh, tra transcatheter out valve. And above, on top, at the level of the outflow, we have the upper crown, uh, the, um, uh, the stabilization arches, sorry. So the lower crown, upper crown, and the stabilization arches that are more or less meant to uh, provide some coaxiality to the device. Most of the radial force comes naturally uh, from the lower crown uh, that are meant to seal, seat the device uh, across, of, uh, across the annulus. So having said that, I guess now, Nicolas, it's, it's time to, uh, to yeah. go for the case. I think so. Um, we could... So we yeah, yeah, Darren. So, and so just, just, just while you guys are getting going, we have a, we have a first question, uh, a great question from Maddie. Um, uh, maybe you might tell us, guys, what what drove the choice of an accurate neo here? If this uh, if this patient was suitable for for various uh, various different uh, uh, valves. As this is a very important uh, question because if you take only the annulus, that is the dimension that we take into consideration for valve sizing, uh, the annulus is in the range of four, five, six different types of devices. And uh, what drove us uh, through the choice of the accurate NEO is, as, uh, as you mentioned, Darren, we have some kink in the abdominal heart, uh, so we need to be able to navigate some kind of, with some kind of flexible device. And the analysis is some kind of vertical, Nicolas, yeah. and the accurate has some kind of av advantages in terms of being coaxial throughout the whole yeah. procedure. Yeah. And I, I would add on top of that also, Didier, uh, but it's not that uh, old lady, it's 81 year old, so it's perfectly in the, in the field of a good TAVI indication, of course. Mm. But it's a patient who has some years of life expectancy, mm. and at that age also a, a higher probability to have one day coronary artery disease. So it's important to, uh, to implant in a device that would leave uh, all the freedom you want to access to the coronary arteries. Um, also important to find a good trade-off between the, the performance of the valve regarding PV leak and the risk of a uh, high degree heavy block. Yep. And I think that one could, uh, could offer a good one. And also, uh, as it is an intermediate risk patient that uh, we have to offer a, a perfect safety profile, so try to avoid as much as possible the risk of mechanical complication as annular structure or face like that. So a self-expendable device makes sense in that context. Yeah, for this particular... Okay. So, yeah, I propose that we, we start maybe, yeah. um, maybe we can start with uh, the claret, the, the, the sentinel insertion. Yeah. And, uh, and before to insert that, you can make a brief presentation of a device for those maybe who are less familiar with, uh, with it. Okay, so um, uh, if we focus most, more, more on the device, you can see that there are three... Uh, Let's focus on the handle. The handle is certainly the most uh, important part of the device. The handle has three parts. The first, first part, the num number one, is uh, meant to uh, extrude or uh, insert, reinsert the proximal filter. Then we have uh, this, the knob number two, that is a kind of articulation knob. And uh, Laurence is going to rotate this. Tu vas tourner horaire. Le bleu, s'il te plaît. Le deux, tourne-le. And when we rotate, if you watch uh, uh, carefully, turn le encore. Voilà. Carefully, it's going to bend that part of the device, and this is meant really uh, to get an articulation towards the uh, uh, left carotid. So it's uh, really intuitive. And then we have the uh, third knob that is meant to uh, extrude, expose, or reinsert the distal filter. And so it's really easy to prepare. It, took, it only took uh, five minutes to uh, uh, Laurence. And then we have uh, inserted inside a regular PTCA wire that is going to be the, the kind of uh, wire that is going to uh, get access to the, uh, the, um, the left carotid artery. So it's very simple. Okay. So it, re it requires a six inch uh, radial, uh, right radial access. Uh, so that's what we have already done. Prepare the patient inserting a, a long six inch uh, radial sheath. And then it navigates uh, towards the, the aorta uh, through the anatomy uh, guided by the, the conventional uh, uh, PCI wire as you, as you currently see. It's, it's, it's always, uh, Nicolas, if you, you, you will agree, certainly agree, always impressive to see how easy it's, uh, how yeah. able it is to navigate, to track through the yeah. vessels. 
uh, because it's a six French device, but it's really, really, really easy to get through, yeah. to get access. Exactly. So what you have done, Didier, because we, while we were discussing, is just come back to the ascending order because it's important. So now you guess on the street on the screen uh, with the calcifications and also with a pigtail, you perfectly see the order curvature of the aortic arch, and you see where the innominate artery is coming. So it's a place where we have to deploy uh, what we will call the proximal filter. So you see that I'm currently sliding the number one knob that DDA uh, uh, showed to you, and then I'm, I'm extruding the proximal filter. So. Here it is. We're uh, having protected yet uh, the, the innominate artery. So now I'm going just to pull a little bit on the wire, then start to bend the distal tip of a capture and try to advance the wire. So here you see that the angulation maybe is too extreme. I'm going, I'm coming back. Uh, to the uh, innominate artery, so I'm, I'm getting a little bit less here again. So I'm opening it a little bit, and here, is here it is. I think here we yeah. we're in the in the left carotid artery. You see yeah. that? So then I just have to pull a little bit on the device to engage the left carotid artery, as you saw, and then I will have to extrude the distal filter in the left carotid artery and by safety just pull on the PCI wire. So you see it takes maybe two minutes, yeah, DJ, two minutes less than two minutes. Yeah. So it's not uh, an additional step that makes the procedure uh, heavier or longer or more difficult. Mm. And it adds safety to the procedure, to our opinion. And that's that's our purpose, in, of course, in everyday practice, but also for this live case today. And we do believe that it's uh, really compatible and part of the streamlined procedure. Uh, if we uh, foresee the future of this therapy, there certainly is going to be a uh, place and need for a cerebral protection in terms of improvement of the outcomes uh, for uh, the patient. So uh, you already have one uh, femoral access. Nicole? Yeah, yeah. just to come back because you, are, you already partially uh, discussed that, Didier, but uh, um, aiming at describing our simplified, streamlined TAVI procedure, what we do and uh, what we did when we, we evolved in our experience is just to eliminate some steps that were unnecessary, but to keep some that were uh, important for safety or efficacy. So conscious sedation, you told that. The mm -hmm. patient has only a venous peripheral uh, capture. Uh, she doesn't have a, a urinary catheter, a Foley catheter. And uh, we have the right radial because of cerebral protection. And of course, we need a control lateral arterial access for the pigtail. So we have here uh, the left femoral access. We could have chosen the left radial. That would, be what, that would have been our uh, um, routine option, let's say. But here, there is a particular anatomical feature that Darren described, that is this kinking in the aorta. And we anticipate that we could have some difficulties to navigate with a shift uh, through this kinking, and then having chosen the left femoral control lateral axis, uh, we'll have a possibility to have as a bailout option, uh, the possibility to insert a stiff wire insert inside the left uh, pictal capture that will straighten the outer and will help us to navigate through. So yeah. this, we haven't done that yet, but it will be our backup strategy in case of uh, of difficulty, and it explains was why we have adapted our routine practice. So now, while uh, discussing and without uh, waiting further, uh, I think we can go to the puncture of the right femoral artery. So one important part of our routine strategy uh, now that we have uh, integrated, I, I think now for um, maybe almost two years, huh, DJ, is just to do the puncture under e echo guidance. Uh, and you immediately see, I, I hope you have the echo screen on, the, on, the, on, the, on the, your screen, right? Yes, we see very well, thank you. Yeah, and what it really adds it, is that you have it straight uh, on the screen, is that you can uh, individualize some posterior atheromatic lesion as the one you see, but can be an issue at the time you will insert your, your proglides or any other uh, uh, preclosure device and that are almost impossible to identify DDA mm. uh, by X-ray. At the time we, do the, we did the uh, X-ray crossover guided puncture, okay. we, yeah. we didn't see that. Yeah. So the technique is just to uh, 
have a first assessment of your arterial axis in long axis, you see. So if you can see the screen of the echo, and at the same time, my hands are the groin. So you see, I, I'm uh, uh, holding the probe in long axis. I'm going down. And here on your screen, on your right of your screen, you see perfectly the bifurcation. The superficialis on the top, the profunda on the bottom, and the common femoral artery. So I'm going a little bit above. And above, you see this posterior plaque that we want to avoid. So I'm going a little bit above. And what you guess and what you see almost just below the artery is the femoral head. Yeah. So we know where is the femoral head. We know our level of puncture. And we have here chosen uh, um, an entry site in the artery above this posterior plaque that could be fine. So now we will do the uh, local anesthesia. And uh, what is important also is to benefit from the echo-guided puncture to improve the quality of the local anesthesia because you're able to insert the lidocaine until the adventitia of, uh, of the artery wall. So I'm making the puncture in the long axis, just advancing my needle, and you have to see that. So you see on the, on the top right of the echo image, you see my needle advancing. And now you see the lidocaine injected and you perfectly see that it's possible to select your entry site and to inject it really at the contact of the artery at the adventitia. You see that? Yes, very yeah. nicely. Okay. So I'm doing it, and then I'm doing all the way, of course, with the lidocaine. And what we have seen doing that is that most of the time with 10 cc of lidocaine, the patient are not, are not uh, painful. So after that, I make, of course, a small incision, as we always do, one centimeter, and then go for my puncture. So now with a bigger uh, puncture, again, the same technique. So I'm trying first, without moving my left hand, to locate the needle. OK, you see Here that, is, yeah. top right. I'm above the posterior uh, afferomatous lesion. I'm just sitting on top, on the roof of a femoral artery. But the issue at that part is that I'm not sure that I'm central. OK, you're right? Yeah, Déjà la somme d'écho, s'il vous plaît? Greg, c'est bien. So we just have to wait to have a live So it's, it's clear that uh, if you really want to locate a precise point of entry, it's yeah. more accurate than uh, uh, fluoro guidance. Exactly. So now I'm going to short axis. So it means that I'm now perpendicular to the previous view. And I'm just looking for my needle. And you see it here. It's a little bit uh, not, not yeah. perfectly central. Yeah, yeah. So it's I'm going to adapt that. Lateral. And here you're, you're getting close. Yeah, yeah. and Very here nice. it's central. Yeah. OK? And you perfectly see the contact with the, the artery wall and yeah, the tenting. Yeah, can so, see the tenting. OK. okay. I, just, I just have to advance my needle. And you see that we're inside. Very nice. Can I ask you one question, guys, about, yeah, sure. uh, about the, uh, the anticoagulation strategy? You've already inserted the claret sentinel. Um, does that mean that you have uh, already sure, heparinized the patient? Sorry, uh, sorry, Darren. Just wondering if you've already given uh, intravenous heparin as the claret sentinel device is already in place. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, exactly. Did, did you yeah, maybe you can, you can manage this. So, uh, uh, as you know, the claret has to be... Uh, inserted in a patient that is fully uh, uh, under anticoagulation with an ACT uh, close to 300, at least above 250. Uh, so Nicolas is uh, repuncturing because uh, the wire uh, didn't get exactly through the, the vessel. So while he's doing so, uh, so before inserting the claret, we have to make sure that the ACT is above 250. So we've provided the patient with apering at the start of the procedure as, as soon as uh, both the radial and the, the right radial and the left common femoral artery uh, were uh, punctured. And now the, uh, the ACT of this patient is uh, 310. So it's exactly uh, in the target that we have decided. And um, so uh, that's why that's another argument to utilize to, uh, eco guide, eco, eco guided puncture because you are more accurate. And this is really, really important. Le G normal, s'il te plaît. Normal. So this yeah. is really important if you want to avoid uh, vascular complication. And you can do it with a patient under full anticoagulation because it's really safe and more uh, efficient.
Yeah, I think that's a very important step. Um, we have one other um, question from uh, from Fasil uh, Fasil Khan about um, uh, about the the choice of the accurate neo. Um, yep. Yeah. We know that this patient has maybe moderate rather than severe calcification, and he, in his experience, he's found that maybe this valve um, struggles a little bit with the more more severely calcified patients. Yeah. Would you tell us a little bit about your experience with this valve in patients who have severe calcification? DJ, maybe? So, yeah, yeah it really depends. We have to understand that all three valve sizes uh, don't carry the same radial force. If you take the, uh, the, to the, the small 23mm uh, device, this is a device with the strongest uh, uh, radial force. And then it's, it progressively decreases uh, with the, the, the bigger sizes. So if you have a very calcified anatomy with a, a small valve required, it shouldn't be uh, quite of an issue because that device has a really strong radial force. If, you, if it is a case with a very large anatomy, you may need to prepare in advance uh, for a pre-dilatation or a post-dilatation for your patient. So it's, it really depends. I wouldn't say for sure it's not the, the device with the most aggressive radial force, but if you tailor it uh, to the patient you're going to treat, it should be okay. Calcification is not a contraindication for the accurate. It's more about uh, applying the proper technique to get the maximum expansion, expansion of the device at the end of the procedure. Okay, so the, while you were discussing that, so you, I think you're also having a look at the screen So, and at, and at my hand, so you see that I'm now positioning the two proglides. I think maybe we don't have to, to discuss a lot about that because most of the team now uh, having experience with Tavi are using this technique to, yeah. to do the preclosure, huh, Didier? So it's two proglides positioned in a crossed, uh, crossed fashion. Um, so you use a uh, 30 degrees, Nicolas, yeah, or yeah, something like that? Yeah, approximately 30. Let's say if we talk uh, simply, the first one is positioned at 10 o'clock, yeah. and second is positioned at uh, at 2 p.m. Okay. Okay. Have you any uh, experience with the newer closure devices, be it the Manta device or the uh, the Viva Shore device? Uh, yeah, we we have tried. It's not it's not uh, reimbursed uh, in France, uh, but yeah. uh, we we have tried. We have a, a preliminary experience with a Manta that is a kind of a, a plug a plugging device huh? with a collagen plug, and we are quite happy here yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. with, so with this device. We are still uh, at our level in the evaluation phase. We have quite a significant experience with the Manta, but we want to understand how to position that this device. Could it be a workers' device for 100 percent? Per, uh, percent of the patient, what yeah. we, we, we believe, or should it be limited to certain indication? We want to make our own experience with that. But it's for, for sure in the future, we're going to see more and more different types of closure devices, and we, we will have to understand how to position them uh, and uh, how to uh, select them according to uh, the patient difficulty, anatomical uh, but, challenges. But coming to your question, Darren, I think it's really important because if we analyze our experience and uh, our results, uh, today I think one of the most uh, important drivers for residual vascular complication after TAVI most of the time uh, is an incomplete result or, or a failure of the current preclosure device we use and most yeah. of the time the, the proglide. So there is room for improvement here. Definitely. Okay. So One now quick we question before yeah? we move on relating to uh, we're getting to the the proglide. Um, it sounds like you do thirty and thirty degrees. Yeah. Um, a question regarding uh, regarding the uh, the parallel closure technique, uh, putting both uh, proglides in uh, in the same angle. Um, have you tried this strategy? Yeah, of course. Yeah, we have also, but to, to my opinion, there is no clear evidence to yeah. to, to maybe change. one one, one uh, study. scenario. Yeah. yeah, there is one study and one scenario. Is you you've seen in that case that there were posterior plaques. If we imagine that these plaques are more protruding, the movement, the location of the proglide to uh, precisely and safely deploy the anchor could be very limited. So if you find a good location, you keep it and you put one proglide on one side, the, the other proglide in the same angulation, but the, on, on the other side, yeah. just to get rid of the calcium. Yeah. That's the only indication I see from... So um, we're at the time of a sheath insertion. So we have two uh, anticipated potential issues. First one is maybe this uh, narrowing at the um, um, common iliac artery, yeah. right common iliac artery, and second is a kink. So we're using the, this sheath that is quite a, a good performing one uh, yeah. with a good uh, hydrophilic coating, a small uh, 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 tip that, uh, that is not too aggressive. So we're going to advance it really, really carefully. And yeah, so far it's yeah. really smooth. Assess how it behaves. 
So, so the iliac is passed. Yeah. So making a pause. What is important when you do that regarding the safety is always to focus on the calcium surrounding the vessels. And as soon as you feel a resistance and you see that you bring your calcium with your shift, then stop because you might have some yeah. problems, some vascular ruptures. Yeah, yeah, and things definitely. Like that. So, so now, so, so, so far it's, uh, it's bit, quite yeah. smooth. We're going to see how it uh, handles that kink, but it seems to be okay. We see the tip that follows the nose cone, the yeah, yeah, the tip of the dilator. But here yeah. it's okay. And what is important? Uh, we will see that better once the dilator will be out. Yeah, it is now, and I'm going to record it for you to have a better uh, quality of imaging. What is more important in our strategy, Didier, is that given the short height of this lady, yeah. we have the, uh, the chance, the, 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 um, the opportunity that the distal tip of a sheaf is above this kinking. Okay? And uh, it's important because it will prevent us from uh, hurting the, the aorta yeah. while, while we will navigate through Definitely. that. Definitely. I think if it's we, a, it's if a we would thing. have had exactly the same anatomy uh, and a taller patient, yeah. Then maybe we will have made the choice on purpose to leave a distal tip of a sheath below this kinking and to navigate through the kinking with a flexibility of a cafeter rather than with a sheath that could yeah. have been kinked. Exactly. And that could have been a, a dangerous. Agree? Yeah. Yeah. So did you think before moving to the next step, we can maybe summarize this first part that was the let's say the patient conditioning and vascular access. Yeah. We reviewed the, our simplified uh, setting for uh, a streamlined transfermal TAVI procedure. We, we saw uh, that despite uh, wanting to simplify the things, we keep some essential steps for safety and efficiency. Yeah. Uh, always have to adapt your strategy to your uh, particular anatomy and uh, difficulties. So mm -hmm. in, case, in that case, we, we explained that we had as a backup the opportunity to put the stiff wire on the left side to straighten the aorta. You saw that it was not necessary, finally. Um, so I think we can move now to, yeah, the, exactly. to, the, to the next part. So maybe just uh, before, uh, while you are uh, processing, we can review the, uh, the Andrew that we've acquired. Yeah. Just with the working projection. And we said that it was uh, LAO 21 codal uh, 9, so we are we are in that projection. Yeah. And we see uh, that it's there is calcium. Yeah. It's uh, it's just our external is so it's it is calcified. It's not the most calcified valve that one could meet. And the analysis is really uh, almost vertical. It's yeah. about 70, 75. So it's really a challenge for uh, for for the device. But we're gonna see. And you see also, I think what is a. Uh, uh, maybe an uh, anatomical, uh, let's say, criteria for having proposed this uh, this uh, cerebral protection device. You see also all this amount of calcium yeah. and, uh, and aferoma in the aortic arch, and uh, this we will we will have some friction on that. Definitely. So I think, to my opinion, it's important to 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 have here this uh, this strategy of protecting the brain. So. Technique, technique to cross is quite standard and yeah. almost uh, almost the same. AL1 capture, straight O35 wire. We're mapping the valve from top to bottom. And yeah, we pass through. If we can have a difficulty, we can have a bailout uh, option that is to reverse the wire towards the ascending aorta. Yeah. And then, uh, while pulling on the on the cafeter, the wire sometimes is diving in exactly. the in the in the left ventricle. So we record the hemodynamic, of course, always. So just flushing all the lines. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you see that uh, it's not here, of course, to confirm the severity of aortic stenosis because it's done by yeah, the it's echo. Done by echo. But it's just uh, to have a reference of the hemodynamics. Detail. Yeah. So what what is really important, and we have to keep this in mind because the uh, Arctic pressure is quite high. We have the peak tip peak gradient uh, to 35. 35. We have uh, what is really important is to uh, keep in mind the Arctic uh, diastolic pressure that is 70. Yeah. But the uh, Arctic systolic pressure is uh, above 180. So yeah. we will keep it like that. Maybe lower it if you have some uh, back and forth movement of yeah. the valve. Uh, once in, across the, the auric analysis. And also we see the end diastolic ventricular the pressure that is close to 30. The so push. we have the metrics, diastolic aortic pressure 70. So we have quite a challenge to uh, meet that at the, the end of the, the procedure. 
and uh, the uh, LVED that is 30, really high. Yeah. Uh, so this is uh, something that we, uh, yeah. we keep as a reference. Heart rate 85. Yeah. It's really a good example of this kind of diastolic uh, heart failure those kind Definite, of patient can definitely. have with a severe aortic. Uh, so now we are inserting the Safari uh, small wire, that is our routine stiff wire, going to RAO in order to, uh, to open the, the, the ventricular projection and to deploy the Safari in a good way. And you see this curve is nice. Yeah, it's always uh, impressive to see how easy it is. Yeah, to, yeah. it is safe. It uh, quite regularly comes back to the position you want this wire to get. Yeah protecting the left ventricle, so it has really become our workers' wire. Okay. For any kind of Did device. I don't remember, we have checked the ACT. ACT Did was 310. Okay, so it, it's fine? It's fine. We and are. now we can proceed with, uh, with valve insertion. Eh? Okay, cool. Okay, so we're changing our gloves. Didier and Nicolas, um, um, very often um, with the ac neo-accurate valve, uh, it's recommended to do a pre-dilatation um, uh, where does that fit into your strategy uh, and in particular for this patient? We uh, are keen on pre-dilating if we have a huge calcium load at the level of the leaflets uh, rather than the annulus. If it's more the annulus that is calcified, we don't uh, really pre-dilate because the risk of rupture at this line is really high. If it's more at the level of the leaflets, we uh, will uh, quite liberally uh, pre-dilate just to make sure that we have a good expansion of the stent frame. Here, it's not the case for this patient. If we uh, uh, recall what we've obtained, you see, so it's uh, fairly calcified. It is calcified, but it's not hugely calcified. And so we uh, expect to have uh, an appropriate expansion of the stent frame. Yeah. And uh, if we need, if we need at the end, we're going to post dilate, yeah. and we will decide. And, uh, on the uh, oh, another comment on that, Darren, is that uh, r you remember that we have we were in kind of gray zone between two sizes of valves, and uh, we have made the choice to take the bigger one. So we, yeah. it means that we will apply uh, an important amount of uh, theoretical oversizing yeah. uh, by the device to the anatomy. Uh, and then maybe we'll extend a little bit the, the radial force we will apply to the, uh, to the uh, native anatomy. So, so Didier, let, yeah, yeah. It's, it's time for you maybe to, to describe a little bit the device because we, be, before we go in. Okay, Nico. So uh, if you see the device from the uh, tip to the handle, Okay. Okay, let's uh, zoom out a little bit just to see the, the handle. Perfect. So uh, what we have here is a very, uh, uh, very, very simple landmarks. You see the nose cone that is uh, white. Then we have a kind of uh, part of capsule that is free of any metallic uh, structure. Then we see what we call the stent holder. The stent holder is a very, very dark and very dense uh, portion of the uh, of the, um, the delivery system, and we t it will easily it will be easily visible on fluoro. You will see a very dark portion. That is the stent holder. On top of the stent holder, you will find what I named before the lower crown. Lower crown are a kind of kept uh, crimped by the stent holder during the deployment. And then we will see the, the stand frame itself, housing the three leaflet uh, pericardial valve, then the stabilization arches. This is the insertion capsule that we are going to, uh, to withdraw. And there, there is the delivery capsule inside. The valve deploys from top to bottom. It's the opposite of what we see usually with the self-expanding devices that expands more from the inflow portion than the outflow portion. It's going to be the opposite and that makes, uh, all, that makes all the interest of the accurate because it's really stable during the deployment. So we will drive you through these steps afterwards. Okay. Now let's go back to, uh, as we have time, let's uh, move to the handle because it's really important to understand how it works. So the handle has uh, three uh, components. The first component is uh, the, the first knob, knob number one, that is going to be rotated counterclockwise just to expose, as I said, uh, the upper crown and then the stabilization arches, the top part of the device, you rotate it counterclockwise. Then the second uh, component is that safety pin, safety button that is going to be uh, pulled, released before we activate the third part, that is the knob two. Everything is uh, labeled in a very intuitive way. We start with num lob number one, 
safety pin, then knob number two. Number two is going to be rotated also counterclockwise uh, to uh, expose the, low, uh, the lower crown. So we go in a two-step for uh, the first part of the release, stabilization arches, then uh, um, uh, upper crown, then stabilization arches. And then we go uh, for a fast release of uh, the uh, lower crown. Okay, so let's go. Let's go. So as it is a self-expanding device, we have put a little bit of uh, cold saline just to make sure that it remains uh, nicely crimped just okay. to uh, get... Maybe you can uh, zoom up a little just bit. Just to get inside the 18 frame shift. And okay. all the challenge, Nico, you're going to tell us how difficult it is to advance. Yeah. So there is a kind of a loader that is used just to pass the hemostatic valve of the, of the shift uh, that I'm passing through now. And now I'm advancing yeah, the device. It okay. was just a little bit difficult to navigate through the hemostatic valve, but afterwards it navigates quite easily. And uh, you see that we, we have passed the, the narrowed portion of the iliac yeah. artery without difficulty. And now at, that, at that time, I don't really uh, touch the wire because the, yeah. the goal is to keep the wire in the external curvature. Yeah, and we, we are going through the, the kinking of the artery without any difficulty. Very, very easily. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. So let's uh, zoom in. To make it clearer for everybody, expand a little bit the uh, Arctic arch. Yeah. It's fine for you, like DJ? Yeah. Okay. I'm so, okay. So you're going to help me crossing the arch by yeah. pulling on the wire. And maybe I will make a small pause here before to go inside the valve, because afterwards I will we'll have to focus on what we're doing and uh, to get really stable uh, at, at our target. But maybe, Didier, uh, you can just come back on the on the fluoroscopic landmarks that you've commented. Okay. And uh, just uh, uh, precise exactly what we will be looking at during the positioning, uh, what will be our uh, targets uh, in the frame as respect to the native anatomy. Okay. So if we, uh, uh, maybe, we, okay, exactly. If we do a brief uh, scene acquisition, you can see, as I said, the nose cone that is in the mid part portion of the outer curvature of the outer, the ascending outer. Then we have a free a space that is free of any uh, stand frame. Then you have the stent holder, that dark, Should dense, metallic uh, structure that holds the lower crown. You see the lower crown that are uh, kept uh, together within the, uh, the stent holder. And then uh, from the distal edge of the lower crown, the first line of uh, cell struts connectors that will be uh, represented as a line will serve as the landmark. And this line will be placed at the, at the level of the analyst. And then you can start to see uh, the uh, upper crown and then the stabilization arches above that. You can see that a kind of line with tiny dots that represents uh, uh, the uh, commissures where the, uh, the leaflets are sutured. So it's very easy. To, once you've understood that, you know what you have to place at the analyst. Stent holder below the analyst, then starts the lower crown and we will put the first line at the level of the analyst. You will see it uh, once we are across. And we have to keep the wire on the external curvature that is mandatory, that is yeah. key uh, for the deployment. Yeah, and just before I proceed, Didier, just to come back on that, because after, afterwards I won't have to move anymore. Yeah. Uh, during the, the release of this prosthesis, the first operator has just to follow what you have, what you have told, of course, and has to enter into the left ventricle in a very straight movement. And uh, uh, in order to keep the stability of the device, as you mentioned, has to keep the, the system uh, together with the stiff wire at the outer curvature of the aorta. So it means that you have to enter, go to the target, and if you're not, you don't have to pull back. Otherwise, you will be out of the outer curvature. Exactly. You will lose stability. So if it happens, maybe it can happen. What we will do is just come back to the ascending aorta and then re-advance in order to have this good, uh, this good technique. Okay. Okay. So let's go. So Nicholas, it sounds like your final motion needs to be forward. Exactly. And can I ask you, do you need to pace during the deployment of this valve? No, I don't think so. So you see here, maybe we're going to focus a little bit more. Okay. And we, are, we uh, have to come back to the working projection that was LAO 20. LAO 20, codal 10. Okay. okay, so here we are too high, of course, yeah. Yeah, again. So we have to go with the line Didier described to you at the level of the analysis. And now we're going to record, record an angio. 
Okay. Okay. What do you think, Didier? I think it's uh, it's really nice. Um, so we see the stent holder, lower portion, distal portion of the uh, lower crown, then the first line of connectors that is uh, placed at the level of the annulus. We shouldn't be above that, but it's 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 cool. It's okay, okay. for so me. So now fine. I'm not doing any more things. You happy? Yeah, I'm not discussing, and you're <laughs> the most important part, Didier. So you're okay. you're explaining what you're doing. So we, um, if you see my hands at the same time, Nicolas is all just holding a forward pressure. And I'm just rotating uh, clockwise, counterclockwise, sorry, uh, the knob number one. We can record just to make sure that we uh, uh, remain at the level of the annulus, and we can see that we are slightly higher. Yeah, so I'm pushing a little bit. Exactly. So it's uh, it's really important to do it in a two steps uh, way. Yeah, okay, that's fine now. Test it, just Let's record that. Okay, yeah. it's better. Yeah, yeah, it's better. Here yeah. it's okay. Yeah. Okay, so now. What we're going to do is to expose to the, to go to the final road of that handle, rotating it counterclockwise, and we're going to record if we are still stable. Okay, Laurence. Yeah, yeah I think it's, I think fine. it's nice. Yeah. So you see, it's, it's two steps. You assess the position. The first operator doesn't move at all, and the second operator goes in a very uh, steady, very stable, and uh, regular uh, way, opening first uh, the uh, upper crown, and then the stabilization arches on top of the device. So if you are happy, Nicolas, yeah. what I'm going to do is just to pull back a little bit the pigtail. We have the landmarks of the calcium to tell us where we are, and the okay. pigtail is going to remain just here. OK. OK, so we're going to record that. So first, yeah. the safety pin. Okay. So I'm just pushing on it, withdrawing, okay. and then while you record, I'm going to expand everything. Okay, okay. that's done. And we have to make sure that the uh, nose cone goes away, and you see that the, now you clearly see the, uh, the stent holder that is moving towards the left ventricle. It's really important to make sure that we don't catch uh, the stent frame itself. So let me slightly pull on the wire to make sure that everything is disconnected. Okay. And, and then, then we're going to yeah. uh, reinsert everything. Yeah. I'm holding only the the, the, the yeah. shift DDN. Yeah, okay. I'm, I, I okay. let you withdraw everything. So I'm going to zoom out just to make it clearer for everybody how we uh, navigate in relation to the also the claret because we still have a cerebral yeah. protection device. And you can see that through all the steps of the procedure, there weren't any uh, issues. Okay. okay. So now it's time to reinsert everything. So what I'm going to do is just to uh, invert. So first. Okay. We're going to rotate clockwise the handle number two, and then I'm going to keep one millimeter of gap just uh, between the stent holder and the proximal part. Okay. okay. So let's keep an eye on the wire because that's yeah. our policy to uh, uh, keep the wire into the left ventricle. If we want to post dilate, we, yeah. we have it, and we always record the hemodynamics. So while while in inserting the the pigtail for final hemodynamic assessment, Didier, uh, what you have demonstrated is that it's quite a simple two-step implantation yeah. technique. First one that is quite uh, um, um, simple but um, um, quite long. Yeah. You can you can take your time to assess that everything is fine. And it was uh, nice to see how you could reposition the exactly. device exactly before. And then the second one that is just a uh, last part of the uh, of the lower crown that is quite fast. Yeah. And uh, at that time, it's important to precise that uh, once you are properly pro positioned uh, initially, there is no way for the device to move yeah. and uh, and no way for you to to misplace the valve or to 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 have a misplacement. Yeah, it's true. So just while you guys are getting your hemodynamics there, uh, Professor Jean Marco has joined us uh, online. Um, and, uh, uh, just wants to uh, to reconfirm the severity of the aortic stenosis. So uh, thank you, Professor Marco. Um, the patient was admitted uh, a number of weeks ago with uh, acute pulmonary edema, um, and echocardiography confirmed um, severe aortic stenosis with a mean gradient of 45 millimeters of mercury and a valve area of 0 0.7 centimeters squared. The hemodynamics at the start of the case um, gave us a peak-to-peak -peak gradient of about 25, 26 millimeters of mercury. Yep. It's very interesting now to see the hemodynamics from the team here. Um, the initial um, uh, pre-TAVI uh, pre diastolic uh, aortic blood pressure um, was about 60 millimeters of mercury. So maybe you might take us through the hemodynamics that you see now, if we can have that on the screen. Yeah, you have it. I think so. 
So if we uh, focus now uh, back again on the hemodynamics, first of all, we have to match heart rates. It was 85 at the start of the procedure. It's 90, so more or less in the same range. And we don't have any conduction disturbance for this patient. It's good. Uh, second, uh, the diastolic aortic pressure was... Uh, about, about 70, but the systolic aortic pressure was 180, 190. Now it's, now it's only 160, but uh, the diastolic aortic pressure is only about 50. So maybe no. we will need to overexpand a little bit the, the stent frame. No. We still have uh, room for to do that if we need. And uh, when we watch the left ventricular and diastolic uh, pressure, it's way better than what it was at the start of the procedure. It was 30, now it's only uh, 19, it's, so it's, let's say it's 20. So hemodynamically speaking, as there was a relief in the gradient of the patient, we can see that the uh, end diastolic uh, pressure of the ventricle is lower, and this is really good for our patient. And uh, just to come back to your uh, comment about the peak-to-peak -peak gradient at the start of the procedure, procedure, diagnosis is made by ECHO. There is no uh, uh, argument about that. And when we uh, do the procedure, we have a kind of some, uh, some uh, conscious sedation. So there are drugs that may generate some kind of uh, uh, LV uh, depression and explain why the peak-to-peak -peak gradient was lower than what was uh, uh, found by ECHO. Okay, so Didier, we have one, one aspect of the final assessment, that is the anemic. Uh, in our um, routine practice, uh, simplified way, the second uh, uh, way to assess the final result is the angio. Yeah. So we're going to do that now, and um, maybe we can put a wire inside exactly. just to uh, avoid to uh, artificially uh, generate uh, some. On va prendre un guide d'échange. Ouais, guide d'échange. Ouais. And Didier and Nicola, um, yeah. um, uh, you have obviously uh, removed uh, the, the use of transthoracic echo uh, as your second as your second step. Do you only use echocardiography to assess the leak if? Uh, if you see an, a, a suboptimal hemodynamic or angiographic result? Yeah, I, I think what is important is to be able to make your decision about what at the end of your implantation uh, needs to be uh, corrected immediately. Uh, so regarding the leak, what is a, 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 a leak significant that uh, would need a, an additional uh, um, in, uh, intervention. And for that, uh, most of the time, we, we make our decision based on the two tools that you have been uh, exposed to, that are the, the angio and uh, the hemodynamic. And um, most of the time, we, we do not need an uh, echo to do that. Yeah. Right? yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's assess the angio. You remember that the, the leaflets are soon in a supraannular way. Yeah. So I don't have to push too much on the pigtail, otherwise I will be on the leaflets. Yeah. So here it's fine. And uh, we're leaving a wire inside because if we have to post dilate, it will be easier to re-engage uh, the, the left ventricle. And this so is very important, uh, yeah, Nico, while you are acquiring yeah. the angio because uh, it's more difficult uh, to get, go back with the, inside uh, the stand frame if you don't have, uh, don't have any wire because it's large, these are large open cells. So yeah. it make it more difficult for you to uh, remain in the center. Yeah, exactly. So here it's uh, really impressive. Yeah, it's fine. No, huh? no regurgitation. Yeah. So this is really fine. Uh, implant depth is perfect. It's exactly where you uh, implanted it to, uh, to be. You see the uh, first line of connectors of the cells and it's yeah. exactly at the level of the analogs. If we uh, uh, freeze everything, we can see that it's going to project exactly at the level of the analogs. You see yeah. perfectly. Yeah. And so what is nice. important, the Didier, yeah, the coronaries, regarding our initial comments for, yeah. for this intermediate 81-year-old patient. Uh, you see that you, coronaries, of course, have patent, uh, like in most of the cases, in all, all the cases. Mm. But uh, we anticipate that the, the reaccess to the coronary arteries would be really easy here. Would you post-dilate, uh, Darren, in that case? or? Um I think uh, I think we've seen very clearly that we have no hemodynamic uh, gradient, uh, um, which would be one indication for post dilatation. We have no paravalvar leak, uh, which would clearly be a second indication. Um, one thing that I do like to know, to know uh, especially with a valve that does not have high radial force, is that the frame is actually open. Yeah. yeah. Um, it would be nice maybe to do a quick rotation of the angio and sh and show us that the frame is is open on all sides. That that uh, I, I think is emerging as another indication for post dilatation. Yeah. So um, let's try to record that. It's not always easy. <laughs> uh, 
No, I'd yeah, it's wide okay. open half. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. That's good. We have a, a question uh, from uh, a, a Gonzaga who's who's joined us online and re requesting uh, the initial and final gradient. So I believe the initial peak-to-peak -peak gradient was 26, 27, and the final peak-to-peak -peak gradient, uh, um, from what I saw, was uh, was zero or one zero. millimeter. Yeah, yeah. One, yeah. Or two, one or two maximum. And uh, this is what we uh, regularly see. There is uh, almost no gradient at the end of the procedure, but this will certainly relate tomorrow to uh, a mean gradient via transthoracic yeah. echo about 8, 10 maximum. Yeah. And I think what what is uh, uh, also a good point for such supranular uh, soon valve is the quality of a gradient. Yeah, it's definitely. It's most of the time a, a one-digit gradient yeah, yeah. below 10 millimeter of mercury. Yeah. Uh, so, great location, no regurg, no gradient, no coronary obstruction, so we can go to for the, the uh, claret withdrawal. Exactly, I think so. So now we don't have any any new and more maneuvers to do in the at the location of the arch. Then we can remove uh, the, the claret. So let's just have a look at the screen and our ends. So Didier has advanced a little bit more the wire, recapture the distal filter, then is going out of a carotid artery. And yeah, you can yeah. yeah. And I'm recapturing the proximal filter and we're withdrawing everything. So it's really uh, simple to insert, really simple to uh, just withdraw. So what I'm going to do is maybe to prepare uh, the the claret to see what uh, if yeah. we have something inside. Or while Laurence, I'm, while I'm uh, while I'm closing Didier maybe. Okay, Laurence is going to close with uh, Nicolas, and I'm going to uh, yeah. prepare the claret. So for closure, our routine strategy uh, most of the, the time experts. is just to close with a jailed wire uh, in order to add another device where in case we have a failure. Here you remember we are in a um, little bit maybe more vascular uh, complex situation. So what uh, I will do is just carefully under a pressure monitoring withdrawing a little bit the sheath. So we have passed below the aorta kinking and I'm waiting, just checking that the hemodynamic status is good. So that's fine. Now I'm just going down the primitive iliac stenosis we went through on the right side. And again, with a wire in place, so in case any damage, any uh, any issue, I can reinsert the dilator on the wire uh, to make the hemostasis, so that's fine. And so what I'm just going to do uh, is just prepare so, uh, the crossover in advance, just in case we have a residual vascular complication. And then we will close. Nicolai, if you didn't have this kinking of the aorta and this yeah. uh, relative stenosis in the common iliac, yeah. Would you routinely do a crossover, or would no. you uh, simply uh, simply take an angio at the no. end of the case? Yeah, yeah, I, I will simply take an angio at the end of the case, and if we would have had uh, that, uh, that anatomical particularity, that feature, uh, we would have been uh, through the radial alone, so two radial access. So then we will do the we would do the final angio through the, uh, the left radial, having the right with uh, with. Um, with uh, the claret, and we will do uh, the final angio through the through the left radial and the, a long pigtail inserted through the left radial. Okay. Very nice. So I'm just advancing, yeah, the wire inside the sheath no, really in order nice. to have support. Then positioning it here, and then, yeah, we can connect to the injector. On va se connecter à l'injecteur, and then close. <laughs> So more and more teams, we, we had this, uh, this feedback while, while uh, hosting some, some colleagues during workshops. More and more teams, Darren, are using maybe one, one proglide alone in small ladies with small femoral arteries and uh, uh, having the option to put a, a plug on top on the, uh, the, the proglide alone. It's not a thing that we're doing because uh, most of the time we consider that the two proglides are necessary, but it, is it a thing that you have considered in your experience, for example? Uh, we've, we've done it occasionally, but our strategy would still be the, uh, the, the dual per close. Yeah. Um, particularly for this device, ah. this, is a, this is a 20 French sheet uh, with, the, uh, with the large yeah, accurate device. And so I think, uh, I think two per closes works well here. 
And if you okay. have a good diameter of the common femoral artery, uh, you usually you don't get uh, you don't usually don't get a significant stenosis. Okay. That's fine. So the, the sheath is out, the wire yeah. is still in, jailed. So I'm I'm tying the first knot. I'm I hope you have a view on the on the groin of the patient. Yes, we do. So okay, first knot is tied. Second one. Je prends des compresses, Laurent, s'il te plaît. Of course, you have to do it really smoothly. Okay. And let's analyze what we have. You see, you have a, this kind of residual small bleeding. Right. So je pro I'm going to add a, uh, a plug on top on that. So uh, it will be an angio seal, uh, six French angio seal that I will add on, my, on top of my, uh, of my two proglides in order to correct um, Nicolas, Correct. Would this you, residual would you bleeding. Consider, would you consider doing an angiogram before you add the plug to assess the size of the femoral artery? Or yeah, it's a it's a thing well, that you're doing in your in your yeah, experience, uh, Darren. Yes, we, we, we would normally um, take a yeah? quick angiogram, and if there's some uh, if there's some uh, some stenosis, we would not add the additional plug. But uh, if there's no additional stenosis, uh, then of course uh, go ahead with the sec with the with the additional plug. Yeah, yeah, your point is good because, uh, as you as you mentioned, it's uh, you, we remember it's a small uh, a lady with a quite small arteries, and you're right. It's important to explain to our colleagues. Uh, sometimes yeah, the two proglides have point. created a stenosis, and then uh, we we could worsen it by adding a, an angio seal. So it's worth exploring it before by an angio before to add it. You're right. So we're going to do that. On est prêt à injecter? Oui. Okay, so uh, we see two things that are interesting. First, we have the answer to our comment, huh, Darren. So. We don't have a severe stenosis created by the proglide. No. And second, you see this residual bleeding related to uh, to the hole, and uh, that is. Uh, so I think it's a uh, it's a good confirmation. But your your point was really good. It's a good confirmation that we have to do something more to achieve a, a better hemostasis, if possible. Of course, the the residual bleeding is not that important, and the patient is a quite a small lady. So uh, um, in case. Even after the, the angio seal, we have a, a residual, significant residual bleeding. It will be totally con uh, possible to control that by compression and uh, and by adding some protamine at the end. Huh? It's true that yeah. we we are not routinely administrating protamine at the end of our procedures, uh, but each time we have a, a significant residual bleeding, we we don't hesitate to do that. So you see here uh, the groin. It's yeah, uh, clinically, nice. yeah, clinically better. I'm going to cut the the angio seal, and we're going to repeat the the final angio. So Didier, did you find something? Yeah, the catch was nice. Okay, Productive. So <laughs> let's do the final angio before we see the catch of the day. <laughs> No, I'd say it's okay. There is something. Okay, yeah. so you see, there is a residual yeah, bleeding. Yeah, there is a residual. And so. uh, it's something we have to control. And you, you, yeah. you never have to to leave a, a procedure and to end up a procedure with that. Uh, so it's possible to control that by compressing and to add a, an occlusion balloon inside yeah. that will help to have the hemostasis. Okay, so I will do that. But most of the time, this not this is really not a, a very very important issue. So I think Didier. Um, we can maybe uh, review what you have caught in the yep. in the um, in the uh, claret device. Okay, so if you can uh, focus on um, the filter, I'm not going to move, and you're just going to zoom in. Je prends le ballon de 7, Laurence, 740. Okay, so if you can come uh, closer, and you can, yeah, you can start to see that we have. Uh, you see, we have tiny white uh, dots that are located inside in that region, and we a have a very nice piece of tissue in the center. Yeah, region. yeah, exactly. Okay. I, I guess it's a part of uh, leaflet, maybe, and uh, because it's not when you touch it, it's not really uh, dense. It's not really rigid, so it doesn't really look like calcium. It's more a, a bit of the leaflet, but it could be also the the wool. We don't know, but it's really frequent that we have something inside. Sorry.
And in, uh, I would say in uh, more than 90% of our patients, we found something. So it's really, uh, it makes the point for uh, maybe a need for a, a um, cerebral protection for every single patient, but this is another discussion because there is the financial also aspect also, and we have to keep this in mind. Okay, I think you can think... inflate here, DJ, yeah, it's fine. Okay. So we're okay, going to do that inner inflation. So yeah. it's what kind of balloon is that? It's a uh, 7.40 millimeter balloon. Okay. okay. So seven millimeter is uh, almost the, the diameter of the. Uh, it's almost the diameter okay. of the artery uh, we measured uh, with a CT scan. It yeah. was uh, 6.5 actually, but non-calcified, so it tolerates mm. a seven. Um, and um, usually we do that during uh, three to five minutes. Yeah. Then control the uh, control VNGO at the end, and most of the time it's fine. So maybe Darren, it's time to to close this uh, this transmission and to to wrap up. I think um, our objectives, DDA, were uh, first to discuss uh, what is a streamlined transfermal TAV procedure, uh, which steps are essential for safety efficacy, which steps uh, can be eliminated with experience. Mm which ones you have to adapt uh, to each particular case. Second objective was to uh, uh, discuss uh, how and uh, uh, to deploy the cerebral protection device and what can be the benefits. Mm -hmm. And the last one was to uh, um, illustrate the, the key steps of uh, accurate neurotransfermal implantation. Mm -hmm. So I hope that uh, uh, you all will have taken some good learning points uh, from uh, from this uh, live case, uh, it's time, of course, to uh, to thank all the team here and huh? Didier in the cat lab, uh, mm -hmm. you, Darren, and uh, and Jean Charles, and uh, and all the technical team that help us to to broadcast this live case. Thank you very much. So thank you, uh, thank you to the team in the cat lab uh, for demonstrating such a, a fantastic case for showing us. Um, that the individualized patient yeah, approach is so important. Huh? Um, um, the team uh, clearly identified uh, this patient as having a very high-risk aortic anatomy um, and tailored their strategy <laughs> accordingly. Um, the patient was treated with a, 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 a sentinel device and we saw that that may have had uh, significant implications no. for this patient's outcome. We saw a very careful approach to a difficult um, descending aorta um, that, uh, that uh, certainly prevented important complications. We saw a choice of a, um, a large uh, Boston Scientific accurate NEO valve, um, which yielded no PVL, um, no um, uh, transvalvular gradient without the requirement for pre or post dilatation. And most importantly, uh, an excellent result for the pacemaker also, or for the patient also with no requirement for a, for a pacemaker as is um, traditional with this valve. Finally, we saw the importance of a step-by-step -step closure of the femoral anatomy, uh, and we saw that um, the, the team in Pasteur uh, do not take any shortcuts in terms of ensuring that they have a perfect um, uh, arterial closure. So thank you to, uh, to the team here in the cath lab. Thank you to, uh, to PCR for hosting us. Uh, uh, thank you, Jean-Charles, for, for joining me, uh, and we wish, you, uh, we wish you an enjoyable evening, uh, afternoon or morning, wherever you are in the world. Thank you. Thank you.